Hey there everyone. Today we're going to be talking about Graham Harmon's idea of a flat ontology from his book Object Oriented Ontology. This is a very interesting work, um, a good like intro to a notoriously nebulous field of philosophy, ontology, right? The philosophy of being. So talking about what makes something exist versus not exist. What is the difference between the two? How do we create categories of existent entities and whatnot? You know, what is the difference between an object and an entity and an event and all of these other things? But one of the topics that I find the most interesting in this book, which, you know, it's not the most compelling thing I've ever read, but it is, once again, quite a good uh, introduction book, is the idea of a flat ontology. So in this lecture, which will be short, we're just going to be talking about what this idea is and what might be useful. Now, object-oriented ontology is also known as speculative realism. So it's trying to take the speculative, speculative in the sense of Hegel's philosophy, and you know, the, the same way that phenomenology is speculative, it's drawing insights into ontology from the way in which our, you know, our speculation works, our ability to perceive and interact with the world and with various beings. And, of course, it's a realist ontology, which means that it's supposed to Hegel's idea that ontology, you know, this is also Descartes, that ontology starts from the perspective of an independent, isolated, retracted subject who looks upon objects and is mediated by perception, which creates this sort of interminable gulf between the subject and the objects experienced. Instead, and he's definitely indebted to Heidegger because of this, he believes that we are not as special of entities as we would like to think. That in fact, we do not, this is a Heideggerian insight, we do not really exist in the world as some separate detracted entity which has to bridge this gap the gap between the subject and object is something Harmon believes has been created and imposed. And as such, he wants to try to move away from an ontology which, for example, is going to privilege human beings insofar as we are special because we are you know, rational animals, because we are children of God, because we are, you know, maybe we have some sort of special traits that set us apart from everything. And this is not to deny differences between human entities and other entities, but Harmon is trying to get rid of a privileging that happens with the human entity, where, as he says, they take up half of our ontology, where it's human beings over here and everything else over here. This is basically Descartes and Hegel, the existence of outside objects, there's that inside-outside language of subject-object dualism, this rift makes it such that human beings are the precondition that allows the world to exist, instead of the other way around, right? This is the Heideggerian turn of, no, we are in the design, we are being in the world, or in the world being, we are, you know, kind of attuned to our world and our being is predicated upon the being of the world and we exist in an everyday manner most of the time in such a way that we do not exist as these rational, independent, contemplative subjects from a theoretical perspective. We don't come at the world from a theoretical perspective, but rather we are integrated into it such that we are an object among other objects. And one of the things I like about Harmon is that in object-oriented ontology, obviously our ontology is oriented around objects. You could think of this as entities, right? Entities is perhaps the most ontologically neutral term that we have. 
objects starts to have more of like, a, oh, I'm objectifying a person and that, you know, implicitly has some negative value judgment behind that. But no, in object-oriented ontology, object has the same ontological neutrality as entity does. An object is anything from a book to a person, to a hallucination, to a concept, to a fictional character like Sherlock Holmes is a very common one. And what a flat ontology aims to do is treat all objects in the same way rather than assuming in advance that different types of objects require completely different ontologies. That's Harmon's words. And this is something that he shares with, as he says, Manuel de Landa, who is a famous Deleuzian scholar. Um, there's definitely some kind of some hearkening to Deleuze in this work. And this is similar to, for example, we have humanism, right, that treats, at least in ethics, treats humans as ethically significant and unique that humans are the object of our ethics. They're the ones that are of concern. Everything else is secondary. And then you have transhumanism coming in and saying, no, actually humans aren't the most important thing ethically. Maybe there is things like the environment or animals that are not humans that are of consideration. And with a flat ontology, we're basically starting from that same kind of perspective where we've flipped things around and we've tried to de-hierarchize our ontology. And Harmon points out that we don't necessarily have to stay at a flat ontology, but we must begin at the flat ontology, such that instead of beginning from the philosophical abstraction that is the subject divorced from the world of objects, instead of starting from that, we start from a perspective of, I am an equal object to other objects, and we start from there. And from that position, we can pick out the unique individuality of each human, of each book, you know, of every entity. And we don't necessarily have to treat those individualities as all equal. Like for example, there are plenty of amazing things that humans can do that other entities or other objects simply cannot do. But when it comes to, for example, the, this sort of human exceptionalism is common in ethics, where humans are special because we are rational or because we can create technology, right? All this different stuff, which by the way, some of that is kind of being disproven insofar as there are other entities who appear to be able to create technologies that aren't humans. Um, we can also just think of like early, like ancestors like uh, Homo neanderthalensis or Homo habilis, which appear to be able to form some sorts of technology, also form kinship groups of sorts. But grounding human exceptionalism as like an ethic, for example, depends on just privileging certain things that humans can do while failing to realize there are plenty of things humans cannot do, such as run like 70 miles per hour like a cheetah, you know, some crazy speed. I don't exactly remember the, the miles per hour of a cheetah, but there are plenty of things that humans cannot do that other entities can do. That if we widen our ontology a little bit, we see that there are unique things which belong to certain classifications of objects, right? Humans, cheetahs, books, all sorts of different things. You know, I would argue a book has a lot more permanence than a human does. Um, they, they last a lot longer than a human does, that's for sure. So Harmon wants to point out that it is very advantageous to start from the perspective of a flat ontology in order not to interpolate in our presuppositions about what entities are the most valuable or useful. He says, if it strikes you as implausible that human beings, however interesting we may be to ourselves, deserve to fill up a full half of philosophy, then you are already on board with object-oriented ontology's critique of modern thought. And within this realm of modern thought is, for example, the, the split between nature and culture, that nature is super deterministic and culture is just a hubbub of, uh, of random things that are irrational. Instead, 
we're trying to find an ontology that is able to accommodate all of these different entities without presupposing, for example, the privileging of the human perspective. And this does not mean to neglect that we have a human perspective when looking on the world. Obviously, I cannot escape the uniqueness of my human subjectivity and the presuppositions that carries with it. But I can try to mitigate that by adopting this flat ontology, by being open to the various entities which exist in the world and thus the usefulness of the idea of a flat ontology from Graham Harmon's object-oriented ontology. So I hope this has been useful in gaining some insight into this rather helpful tool, and it is a tool at that. It is a, a useful axiom for talking about ontology. Check out any of my other lectures I've done on phenomenology, German idealism, gender theory, postmodernism, and other literature. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access, among other things, to a private philosophy Zoom, which you can tailor to your needs. Maybe you need help with some reading or some philosophy concept. Um, we've also got an exciting Heidegger reading group we're doing on being in time starting in about a week and a half. So if you want to join in on that, please do. Also, I have super thanks available if you just want to donate to the channel because books are not cheap. That's it for this lecture, and I'll see you in another.